And we're live. Hello and welcome back. My name is Robert. I'm part of the Sousa and Rancher community here at Sousa. And you're here for today's masterclass. And I think we're talking about ranch. No, we're not. We're not talking about rancher because we have Dan Garfield on. Dan is from Code Fresh. Um, I don't even know your exact title, actually. We have a we have an introduction slide. We can go to that. But Dan, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, glad to be here. <laughs> All right. Um, so today's class is GitOps with Rancher and Argo CD. Um, and Dan, again, gracious with his time. We've actually talked a couple times before. It's usually do partner interviews with him that you guys have seen before at KubeCon. We've done it in the last two KubeCons, both in Valencia and in uh, um, what's the last one? Los Angeles. Um, so this should be nothing new for our community. Um, but with no delay, we'll just get started. Dan, you want to start sharing? Go through all the... Uh... There we go. Yeah, you should be able to see my screen now. We're all set, uh, and I've got my I've got my Argo mug here. Yeah, and I... Hold I've on. I've got my on. Argo t-shirt we're representing properly. Uh, even I got an Argo t-shirt to on today, and I know it's blasphemous because everyone knows that I only own, I only own Rancher shirts, so this is the only, the first shirt I have that's not Rancher, so I'm proud. <laughs> so uh, I'll be watching the chat as we go through, and feel free to make comments and and ask questions. And um, I always think that these things are way better when they're conversational, when people are engaging. So as you're looking at stuff, as you're seeing stuff, as you're having questions, put it in here because it's a it you know it makes it a lot more interesting i see we got people joining from egypt i think we got people from all, all over the world joining which is uh, always lovely to see so to introduce my well i guess we have all of these but okay few few uh yeah so a few slides here so yeah yeah um here here's some some housekeeping things the platform we are using is called Crowdcast, and below you can see the chat. Some people are using it. If you feel comfortable telling us where you're from, please do put it in the chat. We'd love to. I love telling my kids. I talk to people around the world and not just uh, other Ohioans. Uh, there is a poll. You'll see those come up. I'll be asked, or if you have a question, please ask a question and upvote and downvote it. I will put it in polls. So if you see those, I will put it in chat to say, "Hey, go answer these things." It helps us keep the conversation going. So next slide. <clears throat> this is a master class this is you know 45 to 75 minutes depending on the questions we welcome questions as as much as you got um please keep them on topic so if it's a little off topic we'll just have you route those questions over to the community and we'll get them answered over there um we try to get them all but if we don't then we'll get to you uh within the community we always answer these things this is being recorded. Um, you will see this uh, on YouTube here when I get the video cut and cleaned and put up there. So this will be up there. So if you're asking those questions, it's already there. I think that's it from my side. I think it's your slides now, Dan? Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, let's get into it. So uh, yeah, session's gonna be recorded be on YouTube. So let me introduce myself. My name is Dan Garfield. I am a co-founder and Chief Open Source Officer at CodeFresh. We are an enterprise Argo company, and I am an Argo project maintainer. Truthfully, I don't do a ton of uh, code contributions these days, um, but uh, do help out just a little bit on some of that stuff. More on the community side, um, so less interesting, probably. Um, we're gonna be talking about uh, avoiding configuration drift. So just to back up on this talk title, we're gonna be avoiding configuration drift with Argo CD. And a lot of you folks might be thinking, what is configuration drift? Don't worry, don't worry, we're gonna cover it. And this is really about GitOps at the end of the day. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna even up level it even a little bit more and get um, deeper as well. So we don't need to go through the, uh, we're gonna cover just a brief intro to Rancher, explain some configuration drift. We'll talk about GitOps. We'll talk about bi-directional sync and what, what we're really talking about. It's more unidirectional sync now that I think about it. Um, Self-healing Kubernetes clusters. We're going to get into a demo and we'll do Q&A. And &A and we will be rocking and rolling from there. Um, from a Rancher introduction slide, and uh, I don't know if you prefer to talk to this, um, but Rancher has like a ton of tools. And, and most of you are probably are already aware of this. We've got Rancher Kubernetes Engine. We've got the Rancher Service, which allows you to manage many instances of kubernetes and many destination clusters you've got fleet which is part of that um 
and uh, provides um, not only authentication services and proxy services, but uh, you know allows you to go pretty deep um, in in managing really Kubernetes at scale. So if you have a ton of Kubernetes clusters, this is where it becomes really interesting. The first place that I saw this, so there are a couple of places actually that I see this. First off, if you can see behind me, this stack of machines over here, this is actually running uh, Rancher K3s. Um, so this is my home lab cluster. And uh, I, I got a couple of, of um, HP Elite Desk, I think, G3s or something. And I got them all off of uh, University Surplus. I don't know if you all have that where you're from, but if you go to a local university, they usually have Surplus and you can buy machines on the cheap. So my I upgraded my Kubernetes cluster recently with a bunch of Surplus machines. So now I have a lot more power than I used to. Uh, before that, it was all Atomic Pi clusters. Um, and uh, so I've got Rancher K3 is running as my Kubernetes distribution. And then you have these other services from Rancher that allow you to manage scale. And where I first saw Rancher really being used at scale, when we were organizing GitOpsCon, we invited Chick-fil-A to come and give a talk. And I think you've all probably seen Chick-fil-A give a talk. Uh, if somebody in the chat wants to throw their uh, GitOpsCon talk into the chat, um, they also recently presented at the Argo meetup. You could throw a link in there if somebody else wants to grab it. But what they're doing is they're using Rancher with Fleet with Argo CD. And that's really the basis of where I came at for this talk was looking at what they did and the success that they've had and saying, okay, well, how do we introduce Argo CD to more people and help them understand GitOps and um, make this more accessible? So what they essentially do is they use uh, Argo CD, which is a tool we're going to introduce. Um, many of you are probably familiar with it. It's the world's most popular and most uh, most used GitOps tool today. Um, and they use it with Fleet. And what they do is they basically have in every storefront. So for many of you, I see you're from Germany, you're from Brazil, you're from South Africa. You're probably not familiar with Chick-fil-A. Think McDonald's, uh, except better chicken, uh, more focused on chicken. But it's a, it's a restaurant. It's a fast food restaurant. And they have a Kubernetes cluster in every store. And what they do is they have all of those clusters are added to Rancher uh, through Rancher Fleet. And they can um, basically manage the rollout across all those clusters uh, uh, by grouping them into regions and things. So they can say, okay, let's up, update the version of our software in uh, in this region, and then we're going to do it in this region, and we're going to do it in this region, and then each of those clusters actually is using Argo CD to do reconciliation for itself. So Fleet basically says, "Okay, update uh, the desired version of applications that we have in Argo CD," and then Argo CD goes and actually manages the update within that cluster. So. Um, it's very self-reliant. Each one is very independent and you can basically rely on each one to come and grab the, the software that needs itself. So if that, if that explanation that I gave you doesn't make sense, it will by the end of the talk. Um, so let's talk for a moment about configuration drift and why this happens. So configuration drift is poison within an organization. Um, basically, it means that you have environments that are supposed to be similar or an environment is supposed to be updated, but for some reason it is out of date with its definition. When we talk about its definition, this is where we go into GitOps for a second. So how do we know what's supposed to be deployed? Well, if we're doing GitOps, we have it all defined in Git and whatever the definition is in Git, that is what should be deployed. Um, and if you think that's, you know, you might be looking at your organization, you're saying, that's not the way that we work. We actually, you know, we update Git and then we talk to Joe and Joe's our release manager and Joe goes in and he does a bunch of work. I don't know what he does, but he figures it out and then he updates stuff when we're ready. And maybe we still have stuff in Git that's not ready to be deployed, but Joe knows not to deploy it. Um, or we have, we have stuff that we've updated in Git, or maybe actually there's some hot fix. And I don't know how he makes it work, but but Joe goes in and he figures out how to make it work. And this is like when I started first building software, uh, 
<laughs> this will date me. And maybe some of you still do this kind of thing. But I had um, I had our IT guy that ran the servers and I would make an update. I would build a patch and I would email him the patch and say, please go apply this. And he would go and apply the patch to the server. And then uh, and then if it didn't work, he would yell at me um, and I would yell at him. And then uh, we would maybe switch out servers or something like that because we usually kept an, um, we kept one server that was out of that was that was basically a backup of live that we could switch to so we could hot swap it if we needed to. And he would go into like the Windows UI and he would specify which server should be serving content. And that's how uh, we did. I think I think all of us have been there. That was that uh, <laughs> part of my career. I did the same thing. So you yeah. told that story and you could have put me there and, and I'm like, yeah, been that been there. I was on both sides of the house too. I was the guy who, who was like, this doesn't work. What's, what's going on? So we've both been there. Yeah. So it's, it's not a great way to work uh, because uh, I mean this, at this point, we're not even using containers, right? This is back in the day. So um, some of you might still be in this situation. You're saying, I want to improve the way that we're running software. Well, if I am running GitOps uh, and I basically said, look, how do we know what's supposed to be deployed in production? I'm going to commit it to Git. And if it's committed into this repo and in this branch, it's supposed to be deployed. That's the rule. Um, that actually simplifies a lot of things. And a lot of the, the grease between releasing software, you start to get into, uh, if you say as a hard and fast rule, once it's committed into this Git repo, it should be deployed. Well, the other area where configuration drift happens is really in that grease. And, a lot of downtime that's caused within organizations, and I would say my estimate, I didn't take a poll on this, but I would estimate 90% of downtime is caused uh, by um, these mistaken deployments. 90% of big downtime. Let's, let's narrow it a little bit. So examples that I'm thinking of, uh, in 2017, yeah, 2017, 2018, AWS had an outage where somebody was making a change. They were connected directly against uh, their production and they fat fingered the fat. Do you know, guys know what fat finger means <laughs> but for the international audience? It means you're typing, but your finger was so big that you accidentally typed an extra character. So it just means you mistyped. Uh, has, it, it's a joke. It's a way of saying my fingers were just a little too big for the keyboard. Um, so, AWS engineer accidentally changed the number of desired replicas by a factor of 10. And this ended up causing all of AWS to go down. I don't know if many of you probably remember this outage. There were a lot of jokes about people's uh, dishwashers not working because they were internet connected and that kind of thing. Um, so that was, that was a bummer. Uh, Costco had a similar um, kind of change where somebody was connected against uh, production on uh, Black Friday and made a change, as I recall. And, and I might be getting some of these details wrong and Costco engineers are gonna reach out and say, that never happened, you're libeling us. And I'll say, my mistake, my mistake. Um, but this is very common. People go in and make changes cowboy style. Uh, they just connect directly to production and they tweak something, they get it working. That's a that's a, a common um, source of configuration drift. I also added security breaches. If somebody edits your live production, they've they've hacked into your system or something, and they're mining Bitcoin or or they've injected code or whatever. Um, this is another case where you get configuration drift happening. And if you're not doing GitOps, you probably don't know about it. Um, another source is failed automation. So if we go into, uh, if we look at like configuration drift, we may be, uh, you know, we start off, we've got these three servers over here on the left. Um, somebody makes some kind of ad hoc change in server two. Uh, and then we go to do a deployment and server two fails, the rollout fails because there's been some sort of ad hoc change. And I, I think about this off, most often in Kubernetes clusters. So if I had a number of different Kubernetes clusters, maybe I'm rolling out or maybe I, I have these different things. So um let's pause for a second because there's actually a good question here is immutable environment is a part of reducing configuration drift at infra level like we won't make any manual updates patches on servers rather we'll recreate them with new golden image yeah so immutable environments i think is 
a really great part of this story because if you're using something like Kubernetes, um, uh, you don't update servers. You make a change and it destroys the pod and it and it creates a new one with your changes. Uh, so they the each piece should essentially be immutable once it's deployed, right? And this doesn't apply just to Kubernetes, but it would apply to other services as well. If you have good discipline, good infrastructure, and good management, um, you won't have to update virtual servers. You'll recreate virtual. You'll create new virtual servers and then reroute the traffic to the new one, um, and that's a better situation to be in. So. This this configuration story when I was when I was thinking about this it reminded me of a story that I was familiar with at uh, that comes to us from a major um, credit card company and they had a situation where uh, they had a team that was working on some components of the service and they ended up laying off the team um, this was a number of years ago that there was an economic downturn so they laid off the team and uh, they expected that they were going to move over the management of the service to uh, another team that was gonna be taking on more responsibility. And as they headed into Christmas, they had an outage on that service. And unfortunately, there was no one from the team that had been managing that service to look at it and tell them what was going on. And so when the new team that had taken, taken on this service went in and looked at it, they said, okay, hang on, I'm trying to figure out what's going on here, but it looks like none of the changes that have been made to this server for the last year and a half have been getting checked into Git. So there's been a bunch of changes. We have no idea what they are. And uh, this engineer ended up having to, this was a number of years ago, but they basically printed out all of the running code and then went through it line by line to figure out what was going on um, and fix the outage. Now, <laughs> This, this, this represents really a big organizational failure because it means that people are basically making ad hoc changes on top of ad hoc changes. You don't know what's running. Uh, so this drift becomes a real, really big problem. And um, so you'll, you'll notice when this is happening because you have things like it, it succeeds in staging, but it fails in production. If that's happening often, that probably means there's some drift failure happening. There could be some architectural failure happening too. Um, if you have a view and you can just ask yourself, do you have any systems that you view as like, oh, you don't touch that system. That's, you know, that's Joe's system. We don't mess with that because it's uh, it's a whole thing. It's complicated, you know, da, 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 da. Well, it's probably not complicated. It's probably poorly implemented. <laughs> that's probably what it means, right? If you have a system you're afraid to touch, it means that there's probably uh, configuration drift problems. Rip that Band-Aid off and start, if if you can't deploy updates to a system, it means, you know, the, the, the old saying is, if you want to get good at something, do it repeatedly, right? So if you want to get good at updating that system, start doing it repeatedly. Um, because if you can't update a system, if it's off limit, it's already fragile. It's going to break. You just don't know when it's going to break. So you may as well get into the, the habit of starting to update that system now, right? Um Lots of hacks, quick fixes in specific environments. Those things become very common where people are like, oh, you have to add a little overlay. You have to you have to add a little tweak to this when you deploy it because this environment, it's special. It's a special snowflake. Um, and people are trying to figure out what the difference is between these environments. These are, these are good symptoms that you have a lot of configuration drift problems and that you're probably not following and getting the full value out of GitOps. And some people like this goes back to... Um, I'm going to say your, your, I don't know if your name is rendering correctly on my screen, but uh, Kajite's question about immutable infrastructure, immutable environment. A lot of people will say, look, we will use something like Terraform and we'll do a Terraform apply. So that gets me my desired state. And so I, I'm, I'm actually working from Git. I actually check that in and it's okay. The problem with that is that the configuration drift that we're talking about usually happens. In fact, it always happens after the infrastructure is created. Uh, people go in and they make a cowboy change. Um, there is some kind of uh, tweak that that people make and maybe they don't document. Um, they uh, A hacker gains access. Um, something happens where that, that desired state, maybe it wasn't even applied correctly in the first place, that desired state isn't actually being met. And so now you have essentially a black box you don't know what's happening there and it's terrifying to touch it because 
you don't have predictability about what's going to happen. So this happens, like I said, with Kubernetes as well. Somebody coops CTLs in to production, they apply some change, and now you go to do a deployment and it fails because it's different than what's expected in staging. This is a big problem. And Kelsey Hightower had a really good tweet about this. He said, kubectl is the new SSH. Limit access and only use it for deployments when better tooling is not available. Uh, you should really only be using kubectl for local deployment. If you have to break glass and use it against staging, that's a problem, let alone production. If you're doing it in production, oh boy, we're in trouble, right? If you're doing it against staging, you really, you should be in the, in the position where you're not even have to do, having to ever do it for staging uh, because if you don't ever have to do it for staging, you know you're not going to ever have to do it for production, right? So uh, you don't want to be having people making ad hoc changes like this. So what's the better way to be making this? So um, there are a lot of a uh, lot of strategies that people employ. They say we have really great documentation for how changes should be made. made. We have audits on all manual changes. We we enforce these best practices. We have great training. These by themselves are doomed to fail because this is ultimately a question of tooling and organizational structure. So these things, they might be helpful, but they're not gonna be enough to get the job done. You need to be using GitOps tooling that is gonna enforce this stuff and you need to be doing it in an enforced GitOps way. So this is when we get into Argo CD and GitOps. So for those of you who are unaware, I'll, I'll just gonna shoot this to you really quick. This is open GitOps.dev. This is an open standard. Um, that uh, we helped author, um, we worked with, I think we had over uh, 120 interested parties. We had, uh, no, it's 90 interested parties were involved in the creation of the standard and over 120 individual contributors. I'll throw it in the chat here for you. Um, this goes into the standard of what GitOps, how the principles that you really need to follow um, at a very basic level to be following GitOps. And uh, I'm not going to go through those exactly just yet. We're gonna we're gonna so, talk. Yeah, go ahead. Real quick, do we want to kind of plug what the slight differences between GitOps and DevOps might be for those uh, you know who might not understand that there's a conceptual difference? Yeah, great, good, great question. Okay, so get for, so from Dev DevOps from a definition standpoint is debated quite a bit. <laughs> we don't really know what it is. It's like, uh, we know it when we see it, that's what it is. It's like DevOps is like developers working with operations to improve and deploy stuff. We've got, uh, you know, we've got the, the unicorn, uh, tale, the, that book, that classic book. Um, we've got all these, you know, books about DevOps and how to do it. Uh, GitOps, uh, I think is best thought of as an implementation of DevOps best practice is a subset of DevOps and DevOps, you know, typically we're like, okay, we'd like to have things defined in code, uh, you know, infrastructure is code that feels like DevOps. Um, we're going to have, uh, you know, um, good separation of responsibility. We're gonna have good communication between teams. Um, and when you get into like what DevOps really is, it ends up meaning a thousand different things at a thousand different organizations. GitOps is a pretty well-defined implementation of DevOps that basically says four things. First of all, yes, you need to be using declarative. Uh, your, your desired state needs to be de entirely declaratively defined. And uh, so that's if you're coming from DevOps world, you're probably thinking, yeah, we, okay, we, we agree. Infrastructure is code. That's important. Uh, declarative is as opposed to um, doing something imperatively. So like if you are, oh, I, I wanna have a server, so I follow this procedure, which is I click create, or I run this command that, um, that creates a server, I, I SSH into it and I make some changes or whatever. Well, the, that's an imperative, those are a bunch of imperative operations. Declaratively saying, I want a server with these, pr these this profile. Now there's going to be a bunch of imperative operations that go on uh, in some sort of automation to create that desired declarative state, but you have, you've defined it declaratively, right? So you're saying, look, I just want a server with these parameters. 
I don't care how it happens. Go and do whatever operations automatically that need to happen. But at the end of the day, I know that I'm going to be able to recreate this over and over again the same way every time because I've declared it. I've created the desired. My desired state has been done declaratively. And we talk about that desired state. We're not just talking about server creation. We're talking about all the software that runs on those things. Um, Kubernetes is very, very good for GitOps because it's really good at this declarative side. So this is why you see so much discussion about GitOps within the Kubernetes world because it's so good at it. Um, the second thing is having it be versioned and immutable. And so this is something that I see people mess up on all the time. I took a hobby project this weekend. I don't know if any of you guys play games, but I was setting up a game server. <laughs> and uh, I, a lot of people that do containers in the home lab, they just use Docker Compose and they just run it on a single machine. And um, it's so common, like if uh, Steam servers, they don't allow you to specify a version when you install a Steam server. You can, you can install a branch and then it just gives you whatever the latest one. It's horrifying to me because as a GitOps professional, I want it to be versioned and immutable. I want to be able to say, deploy this version and I'm always going to get the same thing. And when I'm ready, I'll say, deploy this new version. And so you see a lot of people deploy things where the container that they've specified in their deployment is using the latest tech. Well, <laughs> you're using a declarative system for sure, but it's not actually versioned and immutable. Um, and they'll do the same thing with Git where they'll say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm relying on a Helm chart that is always just whatever the latest is. Well, that's actually, you've taken versioning and the immutable, you've taken versioning out of your deployment equation. Um, and then next we have these software agents that deploy things automatically. They pull that state automatically and then they continually reconcile, which means they're aware of the actual state of what's happening and the desired state as defined in Git. So when we talk about GitOps, it's doing at least these four things. And there is more to kind of solve above and beyond this. But if this is confusing, it should make sense within the context of this demo because uh, we'll show you how this works. Um, so we'll introduce you to Argo, but let's just look at a practical example, okay? So you are making a commit to your source code, right? You probably have a rep uh, repository where your application source code is. That's going to make a build. It's going to make a new container image. It's going to push that image to a registry. And we're going to open up a pull request onto a different repo, probably. Generally, I like a two repo approach for GitOps. Um, and that second repo is going to be your uh, kind of infrastructure repo. And I'll show you what this looks like when we get into the demo. This updates the manifest, the charts. Um, there's some kind of uh, pull request that, haps, that happens. And then the cluster looks and says, oh, the desired state has changed. I'm going to go and make an update. So this is how a deployment would be happening. Now you compare this with a classic CICD approach where you just say, oh, uh, I'm not opening a pull request. Instead, I'm just running automation to deploy the new version. Well, what happens if that new version fails? Who, how do I know what's supposed to be deployed? How does that work? Well, you've, you've created a uh, expected desired uh, outcome with imperative operations rather than creating your desired outcome and then letting imperative operations take care of it behind the scenes. So um, <laughs> that might be a confusing point. As we as we get into this, I think it'll it'll all start to make sense. Okay, so um, from a from a high level standpoint, you basically have Argo CD. You have your desired state in Git. It's pulling those changes from Git, and then it's looking at the the actual state in Kubernetes, and it's saying, "Oh, something about what you have in your definition is actually not correct." So I'm going to update it, and Argo CD is reconciling here now. Uh, when we say reconciling, I'm not connecting, I'm not making a change against Kubernetes and then Argo CD sees the change and says, okay, I'll go write that to Git. That's not what we're talking about because the source of truth is in Git. Whatever's happening in, in Kubernetes is not the desired state necessarily. Whatever's happening in Git is the desired state and Argo CD is going to make sure that, that desired state is going to be applied based on policies that we set. Um, to introduce you to this, so this is a, a subset of the Argo UI, and we'll jump into that UI in a second. Let's just see. Yeah, I've got it over here. Um, this is a view of an application within uh, Argo CD, 
And this is the guestbook application. We can see that this is made up of a service, a deployment, which has a pod and a couple of other resources. And we can see that not only are all of these healthy, but they're all synced. So this is telling me that this Git revision is what's been defined in Git and this sync has occurred and it's working properly. And it's always gonna guarantee that these things are in sync. And if someone goes and changes the, the, the kubectl onto the cluster and make a change, that would show up as drift and it would be automatically detected by Argo. So in order to be doing GitOps, we need to have a component that is aware of the desired state in Git and the actual state wherever that is. So this is why in the Terraform example that we had earlier where I said, hey, I did a Terraform apply. Uh, that bootstrapped my infrastructure, that bootstrapped my components. Okay, now what if someone goes in and changes it? How do you know? Well, Terraform does have some tooling for this, but it's actually, and I don't mean to pick on Terraform, but Terraform is not very good at being aware of state. It's not very good at being aware of state changing. And so if someone makes a manual change, Terraform is very often not aware of it. And so you can't detect that drift and you can't therefore correct it. So you don't actually know what's happening in production. You are assuming that the things that you put into Terraform when you hit Terraform apply have been made into reality. And you are assuming that they are staying that way. My dad said to me one time when I was growing up, assuming makes an ass out of you and me. Uh, which is how you spell assume. Uh, we don't want to assume. We want to know. Um, there's a, who, was it uh, Reagan that said trust but verify? So we trust, you know, that the systems are going to work, but we need to have some verification in place for it. And I heard someone tell me the other day, they said, I don't know if I need GitOps because we just we just lock our environments, you know? So, uh, you know, we just have a CI CD process that updates it. And it's like, okay, that's great. Um, what's happening in production? And they're like, well, what do you mean? I mean, it's locked. So, so it's gotta be whatever was last applied. Right. And I'm like, it maybe you tell me, you don't know. You don't know. You don't know what's happening in production. You don't know. You're assuming good luck with that. Uh, that's, that's, that's a recipe for, for, you know, it's like, it's like saying, look, I deployed the service. I don't need monitoring on it. I deployed it. I assume it's working. <laughs> well, okay, that's nice. But um, what if it broke? Well, I assume it didn't. Okay, well, that, good luck with that. <laughs> um, you're assuming that you're monitoring just because the monitoring isn't down, that the configuration is correct. Well, if you even if you have monitoring in place, hey, your servers might be running. You know, they're serving spam that somebody injected on there, but uh, yo, know, the metrics are all there, so they're fine. You don't know. So you want to know what's happening in production. That's where this stuff comes in. Uh, and it's going to help you avoid downtime. It's going to make things easier. So when I make a change to my application, in this case, um, we've detected manual changes have been made and we find that they are out of sync. The service has been updated. And this could be because the uh, deployment was changed, in which case uh, this sync would show that there was, it would show up out over here or because somebody made a manual change, which is what happened, which is why this is showing up as out of sync. Now, um, in Argo CD, once it detects this, you can have it either automatically correct these things with auto healing, or you can have it uh, allow the, the, the issue to exist until you do a manual intervention. That's a policy that you set at the application level. Um, and it allows me to view a, a diff. So it will actually show me what's changed. And in this case, the, uh, the actual state, uh, the, the desired state is it wants port this port 80 and target port to be set but it's not been set so that's been removed for some reason so at that point we can hit sync it will sync and um that's that state will be set uh monica asks how do you connect argo cd to the image rest registry so that the new image i deployed to the kubernetes cluster so uh assuming i i'm assuming that your question is um there's two two meanings of your question one is how does Argo CD actually connect to a private rep repository and have authentication and, and have that work, which that's something that is pretty easily accomplished in the docs. When you go to add a, a registry, you can add an authentication information and, and you get your, you know, you can pull stuff. Um, I think the meaning of your question is really, uh, if I update the image, how does Argo CD become aware of it? 
And this is actually uh, through um, your configuration update. So you should be updating the configuration. So when we, when we had this process flow back here earlier, where we say, oh, an image has been pushed, we need to open a pull request to get, that could be done by a person or it could be done by automation. The way that I typically do this is I have my application repo and I'll show you, let's just show you an example here really quick. Um, you know, I was, I was joking about my, uh, <laughs> this game server that I was setting up. I'll just show you on here. This is an embarrassing repo, by the way. Um, I've just been plinking around in here over the weekend. So it's, it's nonsense, but basically I have my application repo here where I have my Docker file that's building things. And, um, uh, I need, I, you know, I, I've just been fiddling around with this week weekend. It's a hobby project, but, um, I've got my repo where my application stuff is stored. And I actually have inside of here, um, some deployment information. I have a customization that I'm using and a, uh, a just plain Kubernetes manifest because I just want to add the additional option if people wanted to uh, deploy this manually or something. So this is my application repo. Now, when I make changes to this, um, basically what I'll have this do is this will automatically open up a pull request onto my infrastructure repo. So let's go to that one and I'll show you what that looks like. So this is just for my home lab. Oops project now this is this is the repo that i'm using to run my argo cd instance and i'll just show you really quick my argo cd instance here we go so here's my argo cd instance i think yeah this is this is like we were just about to go into the demo anyway right yeah we were, we were right there okay so this is my argo cd instance and you can see for those of you that aren't aware of argo cd each one of these tiles represents an application and an application is an arbitrary uh, definition of resources that need to be synced along with the destination for where they need to be synced. In this case, if I'm looking at, um, let's look at this demo app here. Uh, I've got this demo app. It's this demo app. Here's the application definition. It's to be deployed at my default cluster. This is the repo where it's pulling from. Uh, the target revision I'm pulling from right here is head, which is a little bit of a no-no, like I said earlier, um, because I want it actually to be versioned, so I need to update that. Um, and then this is the path of where it's pulling from. And I have some policy in here where uh, it's automated sync. So anytime I make changes, it will make changes here. It automatically will prune resources. So if I delete uh, a resource from my manifest, it'll get deleted. And it has self-healing, which means if I go in and edit this resource in Kubernetes, um, Argo CD will pick up on that drift and automatically destroy it, which I'll demonstrate for you in a second. Um, you've, I've got my service, I've got my deployment, I've got uh, my other components, my uh, resource group, my pod. These are all the elements that make up this service. And the way that this repo is structured um, is I have an apps folder for each of my apps that are deployed. So this is the hobby project I was telling you about. And this has a base reference, which if we look at the customization here is referencing the Kubernetes branch that I have um, just cause it's all, it's, it's all alpha while I'm fiddling with it. And so once I complete this, this will be referencing a version instead. So you're actually uh, applying GitOps to your V rising server and yeah, you got this my home lab. This is yeah, awesome. Yeah. So not many times we get this guys and gals that someone is going to do a demo on the game, a game server that he worked on this weekend. So this is actually, I'm, I'm enthralled right now. I'm like, wow, this is actually a real <laughs> use case. It wasn't, so you're not getting a demo. You're actually getting a real world use case that. Yeah. This, that, this is more like a, yeah, it's more like a sprint review and I'm just sharing about my progress. <laughs> in the work. Yeah, so once once this is done, this will actually reference a release, a specific release. And then, you know, if you think about the way this is structured, I have my application repo and I have my kind of what I call my deployment repo, right? My application repo has everything in it that I need to run the application, but my deployment repo specifies what is actually getting deployed. And so I have my base, uh, I'm using Customize here. And if you're not familiar with Customize, it's a... Um, 
it's a Kubernetes resource package manager similar to Helm. Uh, but what I like about it is I can reference the resource from my base repo. And then I also have overlays for each of my servers. Now, in this case, I only have uh, one and I actually just removed it. So I stuck it into a backup folder. So this isn't getting deployed anywhere at this moment. When it's ready, I'm gonna move it into the elite cluster uh, folder, which will then automatically deploy all these elements. And as my customization, it references that base, which I remember was referencing um, my uh, my original resource my, my, in my application repo. And then it's applying a patch for the load balancer. So specific to this environment, I have a IP address. Um, in this case, it's not an IP address. Actually, I just specify that it's node port, which is not the default. So I didn't just make my change. So um, going going back over to our demo app here, if let's just show you, like, let's say that we have some drift that's going to occur and I'm going to share, oh, what's the best way to share my screen here? I'm going to share my whole screen. Let me just move some stuff out of the way. Yeah, okay. So let me change my share. Sorry, just navigating this. Okay, so you should be able to see my whole desktop. So everything's gonna be a little bit smaller now. But um, so you, we've got our Argo instance here. This is monitoring both my Kubernetes cluster and my, uh, and my, uh, GitHub repo, right? So I'm going to switch over to my uh, da, 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 my atomic cluster. Okay. And we're going to go over, get rid of these logs. We don't need to be looking at those right now. And let's say that uh, I'm looking at pods on my default, let's see if we're deployments on my default. And um, this one is elite cluster demo app, which is in the default namespace. And it has simple service and simple deployment. So this is the resource we're looking at, simple deployment. And if I were to edit this, so right, I'm, I'm going around the process. I'm, I'm gonna be modifying this thing. And I'm just gonna change uh, the replicas to zero. Oh, well, I, wait, I don't do it in the status. Hang on. Should do it under the spec. Here we go. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, so I changed this replica to zero. I could do this uh, when I save that. Now, you'll notice that <laughs> it actually happened really fast. This actually saw that there was a, a divergence right away and fixed it already. Did you see that happen really quick? Let's do it in the terminal because uh, maybe it'll be a little bit more noticeable. Make this nice and really big for you to see it. Okay. Um, make sure I'm on the right. Oh, I'm on the wrong cluster right here. Let me just change my kube context. Okay, now I'm on the right, right cluster and I get my deployments. I've got my simple deployment and I'm going to do K uh, deploy scale. Oh, sorry. Scale deploy simple dash deployment. Replicas equals zero. I've destroyed it, and our man, Argo Seed is picking up like too fast. <laughs> but you can see it's just it's picking it up immediately, and it's saying, "Hey, hey, hey. it's not it's supposed to be scaling down. It's supposed to be set. It's supposed to be set and running. Uh, it's not supposed to be have that many replicas. It's supposed to have zero. It's supposed to have one. So if we look at it again, uh, you know, we can see that it's already it's already put that replica back." So it's not going to allow those pods to get destroyed. It's going to it's going to be recreating them. See, they're getting recreated immediately as soon as I try to destroy them. 
So any configuration drift that's happening is automatically getting corrected here. Um, now, if I were to go and change this in Git, so let's go over and look at this simple deployment, this demo app again. Uh, so we have this specified here. Let's look at the overlay. I think I said that the, um, I think I said that my, I wasn't referencing a specific version. So let's reference a specific version. So this is coming from this Argo CD autopilot example over here. And they actually have releases. So I could say, let's, let's pull a specific release, which we should be doing. So we're going to edit this. And we're going to say F equals, I, I actually want to be building always off of this version and set demo app version. What's the other, what's the other tool that you're using there? You're, you're flipping back. Is that? Oh, this? Yeah. This is Lens. Uh, I don't know if any of you are aware of Lens. Lens is a cool tool. It's got a, just a nice UI for monitoring and working with Kubernetes um, and, uh, Basically, you can do all the stuff that you do with kubectl with Lens, but it just gives you a nice visual look at it. And um, I've started using it more and more. I've, I've kind of come around to it. So I changed the specified version. And this is going to pick up. See, it just picked up on the sync right here. It's so fast. 3E, 9D, 4As. Yeah, so it's picked up on that sync. And it's looking and it's saying, uh, yeah, actually, there's no difference between what was deployed and what is deployed. So I was in luck. That's that's what you want to see. Um, and if I look, you know, if I was looking at this, uh, this summary of applications, you're not going to see any differences here because I have this automated sync policy set. If I mm -hmm. didn't have that policy set, it wouldn't be happening. Now, let's say I was going to deploy a new application. And I'm going to show you kind of a no-no. I'm going to hit new app. And let's do a uh, demo app two. And we're going to put this in our elite cluster project. It doesn't really matter. Um, and I'm going to leave sync policy on manual. And uh, the deletion finalizer, um, what this means is that this is wholly managed by Argo CD. And so if you deleted Argo CD, it would delete the resource. So uh, I actually don't mind that. That's fine. But it is potentially destructive, so be aware of it. Um, I'm going to leave schema validation in place. I am going to auto-create the name split, namespace. And I'm not going to do a replace. This is important if uh, your um, manifests are getting too long. Uh, and then we're going to specify our repo, which we're going to go back to this autopilot example and this demo app. Okay, and uh, I'm going to pull from um, the specific, you know, release version that's currently out, just like we did a second ago. So I'm going to do v038 version, okay. and we'll go to examples. Demo app. I think I did all this right. I don't ever do it this way. So, that we, and I'll tell you why in a second. And um, I'm going to create a new namespace for this that I'm going to call uh, masterclass. Um, not going to be a recursive directory. I'm only add, adding the one directory. And uh, this this works with Helm charts. Uh, in this case, it's going to be customized and it'll pick it up automatically. I don't need to do anything special to be going to do that. Um, and I'll hit create. Let's see. Unable to create application is invalid. Repository not accessible. So let's see. Did I specify something wrong in my tag? V0.38. Well, rather than messing with it right now, I'm just going to switch it to head for a minute. We, I just showed you how we could switch it um, otherwise. Let's see. Does it pick up that way? Or, oh, do I need a path on here? What am I doing wrong? Why do I need repository not accessible, but it is accessible? 
unknown error testing repository. Hmm. I don't see why that would be wrong. That looks right to me. We just switched it to head. Z. <clears throat> App. Hmm, what am I getting wrong here? Uh, it's funny, I don't ever do it this way. I always do it through um, <laughs> through my... Uh, <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, let's like choose a tag. tag. No, nope, that wasn't it. Nope. It says that it can't connect to the repository, which doesn't make sense. Why would it say authentication is required? It doesn't like it. Well, at any rate, I mean, we don't have to go through it right now. Um, but the, the point is, if I were to do it this way, and I'll tell you why I don't ever do it this way. Um, I don't ever do it this way because if I just create this app, it doesn't create the definition of the application. It doesn't create it and commit it to Git. So while I'm managing this application with GitOps, I'm not managing the definition of the application with Git. So um, this is this is <laughs> this is why I don't like the uh, this is why I don't ever use this UI to do this is because I actually always just do it um, in Git. So the way that I've structured this repo is with something called an application set. So under my projects repo, I have this elite cluster YAML. And in here, I have something called an application set. An application set is a way of generating applications. And in this case, uh, the generators are looking for any time I have a config JSON that's under apps, any path, elite cluster, and I have a config JSON, it will take that and it will automatically assume that it needs to be uh, uh, it needs to be deployed and it will generate the application based off of this. And it will fill in the destination, the project, the source, the repo URL, all that stuff is going to be set in by what I have sitting inside of that config JSON. So when I look at this config JSON, you can see the path, it's taken arbitrary. Um, and this config JSON just specifies the app name, the user given name, the default name, destination namespace, the destination server, which is going to be the, my local Kubernetes cluster. Now Argo CD can connect and manage many, many Kubernetes clusters. So you could have 50 or hundred in here. Um, the source path uh, I have specified to where it's coming from, the source repo that it's coming from, the source target revision and uh, any labels that I wanna have. So this is all just specified automatically in here. And then I use a tool called Argo CD Autopilot, which is, um, this will, if you use this to install, let's go down here. Uh, if you use this to install Argo CD on your repo, it will write the entire configuration of Argo to Git. So when I look at this instance of Argo that I'm using, you can see Argo CD is an application that's on here. So I'm using Argo CD to manage Argo CD. Um, I see there's some discussion going on about the tools that I'm using. So this up here is uh, Rancher Desktop, and it it just keeps track of your. I mean, we could just do it in a command line too, but it's a you know it's 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 faster just to do it this way. <laughs> so Rancher Desktop does this. Um, Docker Desktop does this. I like Rancher Desktop a lot because I don't have to have Docker installed, and uh, it's better that way. We like the fact that you like the Rancher Desktop too. So I mean, we're happy. <laughs> I'm personally happy seeing that you're using it. So that is the yeah. drop down that I think he was asking for. Yeah, 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 I think I think it's pretty good. KubeCTA, KubeCTX is great too for switching. Um, and then, yeah, uh, uh, I do like Lens um, for for fiddling with clusters. I mean, it's just nice and visual versus. Uh, I mean, we can do it in command line too. It's fine. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, Argo CD is actually managing itself here. So if I wanted to update the version of Argo CD that I'm running, let's go and look at, at our apps here. Uh, Argo CD is not listed under my apps folder because I have this sitting in a special folder under Bootstrap, which you don't have to do, but you can. Um, and if we look at Argo CD, uh, we have the definition of my application. This is a CRD. Uh, this is a Kubernetes custom resource and that specifies what an application is. So once I sync that to the cluster, it's done. 
So this gives me my definition of what the application for Argo CD is. And if we go back and look under Argo CD at our customization, uh, you can see that I actually have um, my base reference re uh, uh, in here. And then if I wanted to have, uh, I have the service exposed. So I have a, I have a custom um, overlay for that under my customization, that's a patch that's getting set to expose it. And then if I wanted to change what version that I'm running, I would just change the reference here and commit it and be done. So you can see how you can use this to manage the definition of application across many environments. Um, and this is why I, I don't actually ever use the UI for creating the applications because I'm always just creating them in Git directly. And so, I, yeah. So pretty had a question here. How does it, how does it create an Argo CD application based on the application manifest? Do you have to have a pipeline? Ah, okay. So this is, yeah, 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 yeah. Good question. Good question. Okay. So when I, the way that, the way that um, Argo CD autopilot works and I'll, I'll drop a link uh, in the chat. The way that Argo CD op, uh, autopilot works is this will, um, this bootstraps Argo CD. So it basically installs Argo CD manually onto the cluster, right? The, 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 this binary is actually taking care of that operation and it's specifying its definition from this Git repo. And then from there, Argo CD syncs everything. So on, the only thing that needs to be synced, uh, the, the only thing that needs to be done is Argo CD is created, it's bootstrapped, it tells it to manage itself and then it automatically will go and pick up the rest. So this is why I'm using this um, application set. With application sets, I don't. When I add an application, I don't actually even talk to the Argo CD server. The only thing I do is I update Git. So if I add uh, something that matches this generator, so I add that folder, that file, it will it will do that. And then uh, Argo CD Autopilot actually has a command line tool that does this. So this doesn't change, this doesn't even talk to Argo CD, it only talks to Git and updates it from there. Um, Duck asks, do we need to create root app in Argo CD UI or Argo CD CLI first? Otherwise, how can we register our application set repo to Argo CD? Well, that's what Argo CD Autopilot is doing when you do a repo bootstrap. Uh, let's say that you weren't using this tool, how would you do it? Okay. Well, um, if I were just gonna go install Argo CD, I would just, let's say I'm gonna do it manually, right? Now there is a, a Terraform module for it. Uh, there's a, a cross-plane race resource for it. So th there are ways of doing it just entirely declaratively, but let's just say we're doing Argo CD quick start and we're just following this, um, this path here. Uh, so I would create, I'm doing manual operations, right? I'm creating a namespace, I'm deploying the resource. And at this point, uh, Argo CD is not managing itself. All I've done is that I've installed Argo CD. Well, now I create an application for Argo CD and I apply that using kubectl. And at that point, Argo CD is now self-managing. So the resource, if, if the resource already exists and you create an application for it in Argo CD, Argo CD will detect that it already exists and it will say, okay, I don't need to sync it. I'm I'm good to go. So it will it will just take over the management of any resource that exists. So in in the example of my home cluster that I was showing you, I actually have a few resources that aren't under management yet that I had applied manually before I had Argo CD installed, and I will I am moving them under management by just creating an application for them um, under my directory structure, which is picking it up. You do need to you do need to apply the application set. It's a custom resource, so this needs to be applied. So you do have a few little you have a few things that you bootstrap on to the cluster um, in order to do that. And this is actually where Rancher uh, becomes really nice as well um, because I can let's, see, let's 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 look at Rancher really quick. Let's see if I can. Um, we're getting we're getting into like <laughs> we're getting into other things and and we'll probably we're getting close close on time so I don't want to take too much time but um, since people are asking about it we can I can show you how this would work 
Um, CSO and open this really quick. Hopefully I don't have to re-log in. Okay, so with Rancher, which is a similar thing, I mean, you have to install the agents, but you can add any number of clusters and you can specify, and I'm not gonna show you this deeply here, but you can specify repositories that you wanna have automatically synced onto those clusters. So you can basically say sync my Argo CD components onto these clusters to bootstrap them that way. That'd be another way to do it. But yeah, I mean, you do have to get something connected to the cluster at some point to start the whole process. But once you start the whole process, so like if we look at my elite cluster, for example, if I wanted to, um, let's say a disaster has happened and my cluster got wiped. If I wanted to run this, I would uh, go get my repo out and I would make sure that um, I was connected to the right uh, cluster. And I could actually do a uh, customize apply on my bootstrap resource, and this would trigger everything else to happen. Um, so everything else would just be bootstrapped, including all the applications. And I would, I, that way I have disaster recovery. So um, anyway, we're a little bit into the weeds. I know I've, I've taken you on a little bit of a tour of, of a couple of different things. Um, let's, let's move into a couple of questions that I think people want to ask. Oh, before, well, let's, let's do, yeah, before we do q and I just want to just call this out really quick. So the reason that um, where we're coming from, I mentioned at the very top of the hour that CodeFresh is the enterprise version of Argo. So we, there's the community version, which is the Argo open source project. And then there is CodeFresh, which is the enterprise, mostly open source um, enterprise version. And what we do is we basically allow you to do this at scale. So if you have many instances of Argo, you have a thousand instances of Argo and they're all behind the firewall and whatever, uh, we provide this universal dashboard where you can search across all the applications deployed no matter where. Um, and uh, we automatically give you Dora metrics. So we automatically calculate how quickly your deployments are happening, how many times you're having failover of deployment. We integrate with CI. So this is worth checking out if you haven't. Um, you just go to codefresh.io and you can get a demo. You can you can sign up and, and use it for free. And we just announced that we actually are, uh, are launching a hosted Argo CD version that'll be launching um, planned is next month. So you can sign up and you'll get a free hosted instance of Argo CD. And the other thing I'll call out before we get into questions, um, is that there is a really fantastic GitOps certification at codefresh.io slash get certified. I'll throw this in here. This is currently free. And um, this actually provides you with a free environment where you can bootstrap Argo CD. It shows you how to do it, shows you how to create your applications, and it'll go through the details of how to do all this stuff with GitOps. It shows you how to do secrets. It shows you how to do progressive delivery, canary and blue-green deployments. Um, all of those things using GitOps and using Argo CD. So I definitely recommend you check this out if you haven't. Um, and with that, let's let's move in to some of the questions because I think that people are asking a few questions. So, um, Kajite, you, oh yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, I think you got the ducks. We have um, Kajite has kind of a question and a follow up, and then we have one and a question. Well, it's Kajite again. He's asked the three questions. So why don't we grab these two that you that you see, and then I'll ask the last one. Okay. Uh, not sure if it's relevant right now, but what is the best practice for managing multiple environments with Argo CD? Single Argo CD instances for multiple environments or Argo CD instance per environment? Okay, this is actually a really, really important question that um, I'm planning to do a talk around. And there are there there is uh, some implication about this um, in a blog post that I'll share on running Argo CD securely. So the reason this guy. So I'll throw this blog post in the chat, which is, is highly relevant to this. But um, why would you, we, we mentioned that, right, in this, in this case, I have uh, Argo CD is managing a single cluster, but I could have it managing lots of clusters, right? So when should I have Argo CD managing lots of clusters or should I have Argo CD per cluster? What would determine why I would do one versus the other? Okay, there are a couple of things. First off is performance. 
So once you get up in the, you know, you've got 2000 applications running on Argo CD, uh, it's gonna, even though they're all deploying potentially to different um, clusters, uh, it's gonna start to have some performance issues. And now Argo CD does have a, uh, an HA version that does allow some scalability, but even if you're using the HA version, if you're hitting around 2000 applications, and, and this, this is super caveated because if those, if those applications have, you know, a thousand resources, then you're not going to get to 2000 applications. So it's, it's a combination of basically how many resources under our management, but um, it'll start just taking a really long time to sync. So for performance reasons, you're going to want to start to split up uh, Argo CD instances. So that's one reason. The other is security. So Argo CD, we didn't talk about this, but Argo CD has role-based access control. Uh, so I can create teams and I have single sign on too. So I can have teams, I can have it syncing to my single sign on and I can have it, uh, you know, you can deploy to these namespaces, you can deploy to those namespaces and that's working great. There's sort of a caveat to that, which is that um, the trust that you have uh, should be at least somewhat tempered. And that's why I shared this um, scaling Argo CD securely because if you think about the operation that's happening, when you create an application, you're allowing somebody to execute a Helm chart or a customization uh, or arbitrary you know, files that could potentially try to reference things that are outside of their scope. And there's some mitigation that's done, but you should be aware from a security standpoint that um, there's, you should trust it a moderate, a moderate amount. And so you, I wouldn't want to have you know, 5,000 people on one instance, um, I'm going to have it, you know, be a couple of teams. So that's another reason to split it up. Um, and this is where that control plane from CodeFresh becomes really valuable because this control plane lets you manage many instances. And I mentioned single sign-on. So for example, I can create my single sign-on once with CodeFresh and then every instance of Argo that I deploy is automatically associated with it versus having to set up single sign-on every time I set up a new instance of Argo CD. So um, those are some of the considerations that you would go into for why you would want to split up Argo CD and you'd want to have multiple instances. Um, the other question you asked is, plus if we're trying not to do any imperative changes on environments, what is the use cases for features at Argo CD like a maintenance window? So yeah, Argo CD has a feature called, uh, so, so first of all, they have uh, uh, sync windows. So you can basically say only sync during these time periods. Um, and you also have the idea of like pausing synchronization. Why would I want to, why would I ever want to pause synchronization? Well, uh, there, are, if, if the situation arises where things have broken in some spectacular way and, um, you know, ideally you just, all you do is you just revert a change and get, and you let it roll back to the previous version. But uh, for the scenarios that you can't imagine, people do want the ability to say, look, something's going wrong and I might, maybe I shouldn't be, I, I, maybe I shouldn't be connecting directly to production using kubectl or using lens or whatever, but I'm going to, cause I'm going to go jump into, jump into logs and stuff and whatever. And actually in the new version of, um, I, I haven't, I haven't turned it on, but um, you can actually access logs and in the, uh, I haven't turned on the RBAC for it, but you can actually even exec into containers if you have the permission set. I don't have them set here, but um, but that's why you would want to have that maintenance window of some kind is if you want to do some sort of manual changes. And sometimes this goes because like maybe your secrets provider is not functioning properly and you need to go and work on that. Um, or you, you don't want to be fighting with Argo CD because you're making a change and Argo is breaking it or whatever. You shouldn't be doing that in production anyway, but um you know, people are used to having that as an option. So it is available as an option. So real quick, you showed us some things that were bad practice and you were like, don't do it or don't do it this way. This is really bad. But you also showed us, um, you have your application repository and kind of like your infrastructure repository. These are some best practices around Argo CD, I assume. Uh, where would someone want to learn more about some of these best practices? Oh, that's a great question because we've got a great blog post about this. So Argo CD best practices is a great blog post that uh, Hannah um, put together where she talked to the community and um, got a ton of things and separating Git repositories is the number one. So that's one of the things that we talked about. Um, 
creating the directory structure to enable multiple application system. I actually showed you that as well. And this, this explains it more in depth. Uh, that shows the promotion strategy, application sets. It actually covers a lot of the stuff that we've talked about, though it goes a little bit more in depth. So it's worth checking out. And then um, obviously the certification, which is free, as I mentioned, uh, is really good for teaching this stuff. And level two is almost done. We're going to have that out soon. So level one is out. Um, and I think we have almost 8,000 people engaged on that. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the world's most popular GitOps certification, um, hands down. It's pretty amazing. So, yeah, there we go. Um, let's see. And then, yeah, any other questions before we wrap up? I mean, I, I think that uh, what we did here, I, I hope this is interesting. I mean, we covered a lot of the principles, and then I kind of gave you a tour of things and showed you how some of these different things work in practice. Um, gave you some general best practices and general tips uh, and then gave you some resources where you can go in to learn more of the stuff. This is kind of more of an introduction uh, to some of this stuff. Um, oh, yeah. Check out uh, uh, Luke's um, talk on uh, multi-tenancy and GitOps with with uh, Rancher and Kubernetes. That's great. Also, you know, while we're while we're while I've got you, ArgoCon is just around the corner. It is. Uh, it's going to be September 19th. The schedule is going to be announced this week. Um, we just finished the program last week. Everybody's just accepting and we're, we're just making sure that everybody can make it and stuff. But there's going to be workshops here. There's going to be uh, a bunch of talks and keynotes. Um, first in-person uh, ArgoCon. We did a virtual one last year. We had about 6,000 people uh, at this conference. It was just absolutely insane. It was the first one we did. So definitely check out ArgoCon. I'll throw the link in the chat. Um, any other questions before we uh, come to a close? No, no. I, I threw two polls out there. Um, the first one was who uses Argo CD. So over over half of people who are on this oh, wow. webinar, they're using it, which is good. Um, and then, sorry, Dan, but I asked who explained the rancher better, <laughs> you or me. Um, and apparently I do a better job at that, which is good because if I didn't, then I'd be probably looking for a new job. But um, I, I'd, I'm, I just voted for you as well. So you just kind of played it. <laughs> Um, I don't think there's anything else. Um, I'm actually, I, I'm, I'm following you now on GitHub because I'm curious to see how you get this beast. Um, my friends, um, play B rising. So I, oh, the okay. idea that you're, you're containerizing this, I'm just like, I'm going to follow this. I want to see if he gets it done and he gets it running up there. Cause that would be kind of a, a cool example. I love anytime you can put a real world example down and you're like, yeah, I'm doing it for a game server. I'm like, I was all in. I'm impressed. Yeah, it's actually, so I'm actually running it right now and it's running successfully. I have some cleanup to do on the project to make it, you know, nice and uh, consumable. And it's it's actually a Windows server application. So my container is actually running Wine to run the server, which wow. is gross. <laughs> it's gross. It is what it is. Uh, but, um, you know, you, you, you it's, it's working. I'm using it and uh, I've been playing on it. So it's working. It's working okay. Yeah, you, you you couldn't get a Windows container, maybe, maybe. I could, but then I'd have to add a Windows node. I don't oh, want right. to. Uh, I like having all my nodes. I like having all my nodes just be, eh. If they're all the same. I don't care about them. I can throw one away. I can plug another one in. If I have to have a Windows node, then I'm gonna have to have like, this is my Windows node, and oh, I actually already true. have. ARM nodes in my cluster as well as uh, x86 nodes. So I don't know. I, I, I it, it would probably be wise, but I don't, I don't want to. Maybe I'll go see what they have available at the sur, sur, surplus and, and do that. Yeah, the wine, the wine is gross. I mean, <laughs> it's not, it's not, I don't, I don't recommend it. It's not a, it's not a good situation to be in, but it, hey, it's running, it's working. So yeah. if any game developers are listening to this, we really don't want to have to use Windows to run a server to run our games. So yeah, make a containerize that in Linux, mm -hmm. and then we we will take we'll help you. We can help you scale that out too. We, we're experts at it. Also, if you're if you're a Steam developer, add the option in Steam in Steam server commands to specify a version. What the heck, man? Why do I I just have to only get the the currently available version, even if it's broken? I want to be able to specify whatever version I want. Yeah, well, I might tweet that later. Just uh, just see what happens. See if see if they have respond. Yeah, see if you can get a move. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, well, Dan, thank you very much. We do appreciate it. You're always welcome back to to speak to the community. And I think I'll be seeing you here in a few months in October. Are you going to be in Detroit for yeah. Con? Okay. 
Uh, we, we have got GetOpsCon happening in Detroit, and uh, there's going to be some really amazing talks. Actually, that CFP just opened. So okay. if you half the people here are already Argo users, uh, if you have a CFP you want to get in, uh, a talk you want to get in for GetOpsCon that just opened up. GetOpsCon. Let me actually let me bring it off here. GetOpsCon. Let's put the link in there for everybody. Let me find that. I want to make sure I post it so people know. It's up. It's actually coming from the Linux Foundation. I didn't. I did not know that. Yeah, it's a CNCF event. Yeah, yeah. There you uh, go. Open Jobs is a CNCF project. Oh, okay. Okay. I got um, to keep my, on top of this. I threw my Twitter in the chat. Um, feel free to hit me up directly or DM me if you if you're struggling, especially if you're working on like scaling Argo CD and you you want advice or thoughts on that. Happy to. <laughs> Happy to help you on that. That's something that um, I do quite a bit. So feel free to, you know, my DMs are open. So uh, reach out anytime. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Dan, once again, and everybody else. We'll see you in the community. Mm -hmm.